Hey there, it's Mike Langford. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast brought to you by Truelytics, the one and only comprehensive advisor transition management platform. This week on the show, I have John Prendergast, the CEO and founder of Blue Leaf with me. And this conversation is quite the treat for me because John and I go way back to before he started Blue Leaf. And in fact, while he was starting Blue Leaf and coming up with a concept, he and I spent quite a bit of time together because he was bouncing the ideas off me and asking what I thought about different concepts. Is this a problem that needed to be solved? Where's your pain point? Uh, what would you think about this feature? What do you think about this design? He was going through something called the lean startup process, uh, which was relatively new at the time. Now, just about every technology company, regardless of industry, uses at least portions of the lean startup process. And we've talked about that on this show before, right? Most notably with Eli Gasser, the chief technology officer for Truelytics, the lean startup process is fairly simple. Like before you go through all the heavy lifting of designing a product and, and trying to roll it out to the market, right? Why not come up with the ideas, put it in front of your potential user and customer, ask them what they like, what they don't like, would they use this, would they not use this? Is this some, a problem that really needs to be solved? And then go out and prototype a minimum viable product. Like solve the problem as minimally as you can with the least amount of work you have to put into it and then put that product back in front of those users and customers and then ask them to use it. And ideally ask them to pay for using it so they're actual customers, get them to tinker with it, give you feedback and then now iterate over time. So uh, actually, if you look at John's LinkedIn profile, he still has lean startup evangelist there because he was really at the forefront of this. And I can remember attending an event at Microsoft's big, uh, what they call it the nerd center. It's like New England uh, research and design center for uh, uh, Microsoft there in Cambridge. Anyways, big event where Eric Reese came and signed his book and had this whole kind of little mini conference on lean startup stuff. Anyway, John's very influential in that community, uh, been very successful with Blue Leaf. I'm really excited to see that they they made it and they've kind of reached that escape velocity and are doing really well. So this conversation is going to be really exciting for me, like I said, uh, for that reason, but also for you. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. We cover a lot of ground uh, about our industry, about the needs of our industry and, and the evolution of kind of building on what we did with Tony Steak of Advise It and Have a Plan last week, uh, taking some of that momentum about thinking about the future of the space um, and, and what are the needs of the modern financial advisor and, and where do we see the modern financial advisor going in the next decade or so? And we spend a lot of time thinking about that, that decade to come, because there are some serious trends that we all see, we all know coming and technology is going to play a big role in helping us continue to serve our clients to the fullest and to what they expect. Okay. As always, make sure you like, and subscribe to the podcast. If you're over on the YouTubes, we're there, right? So this is the second episode that we're publishing the full video of the recording on YouTube. So do like and subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, share this as well. You can also catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you like to get your podcast jam on, okay? And please do send in your questions and suggestions for guests for the show. Always love to hear from you, podcast at Truelytics. We'll get that done, or you can just... Hit us up on the socials. You can find Truelytics everywhere or find at Mike Langford pretty much everywhere as well. Love to hear from you. Uh, we're always looking for really interesting people and really interesting uh, ideas to share on the show because, hey, look, that's how we know we're producing a show that you like is that you let us know what you like, kind of the lean startup model for the podcast. Let's get some content that you like, you find valuable that can help you move your business forward. Okay. All right. Let's get to it with John Prendergast of Blue Leaf. Well, John, I am so excited to have you on the show. And, and it's funny, I kick off every episode pretty much the same way, saying, hey, I'm so excited to have you on the show. But I'm like incredibly excited to have you on the show because you and I have not seen each other live face to face in almost 10 years, I think. Well, you might have been down here in Austin once since I moved here and our paths crossed, but wonderful to be face to face once again. So welcome to the show, buddy. Yeah, I'm, I'm really psyched to be here. Um, always fun to talk to you. And uh, you've always found that when we, we chat, uh, interesting things come up. So, uh, so really looking forward to it. 
I like that. You know, that is the best kind of conversation when you, you know, you start talking about stuff and, and interesting things come up where you just kind of, you know, sometimes you get on a phone call or, or something like this and you kind of have in your mind, like, Hey, here are the things we're going to talk about. But before you know it, you're talking about other really cool things and, uh, you know, smart, innovative, curious minds get together. Awesomeness tends to happen. And that's kind of like a mantra that I live by. Right. I mean, I, I put this event on here at South by Southwest every year. Uh, for the fintech ecosystem. And that's really what it was all about. It's like, hey, get a bunch of cool people who are relevant to each other in a room and see what happens. And and, and cool stuff has, has uh, blossomed out of that. Uh, I wanted to like kick things off with us today, kind of going back to the origin story of Blue Leaf. And we can even kind of start before that, but how you and I came to know each other because you met me right at the point where I was going through a fairly significant career shift, right? I had left Fidelity, started my own investment firm. But shortly after starting that RIA, I started a tech company called Tweetworks because I was, I had promised myself I would not, I was not going to miss another technology revolution. I had missed the dot-com boom. I was still in business school, came out during the dot bomb. And, uh, I, I got enamored with social media because of my investment firm. I, I was using tools to kind of grow the business and so forth. Started getting active on Twitter and then saw that there were some needs there. So I, I created this company called Tweetworks and so forth. And you and I connected kind of during that time, you were an advisor for a company called 140, uh, Laura Fitton's company. Uh, and I think that's how you and I met. But then relatively quickly after that, you asked me to go to lunch and we could to talk about this thing called Blue Leaf, and I think at the time you hadn't named it yet, but you were talking about the startup idea. You were working on a lean startup concept. You were kind of iterating, trying to get find out what the needs were. So I thought we'd kind of go back there about the origin story of Blue Leaf. How, how did this come about for you? What was a little bit of that journey like? Sure. Um, you know, it's funny when you, you said origin story, it, uh, it's a great way to ask a guest this question because it, it makes everybody feel like a superhero, right? Because only superheroes have origin stories, right? Um, I'll the superheroes, buddy. Come on, let's go. We go through so, a lot of stuff. So to I'm going to, I'll strap on my cape and see what I can do here. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, so for me, um, all of this started, uh, in, uh, in 2008. So I was an investment banker uh, for a chunk of my career. Um, so doing mergers and acquisitions, doing you know, public financings and, and the like. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, I don't know, like career number three or four for me. I've, I've done a lot of different things. I'm older than I look, um, is what I am told. And, um, and so 2008 happened, a uh, terrible financial crash, and I got a lot of calls from panicked friends and relatives, and um, none of them could sort of wrap their heads around what was happening. Um, and they couldn't even tell sort of what they had. Um, it was scattered, right? They couldn't see it all in one place. Um, and this is before, um, you know, mint.com you know, um, that Intuit eventually bought um, was uh, doing anything material with investments. And, uh, I thought, wow, this is a real problem. And at the same time, I had some professionals calling me um, uh, who were RIAs and, and others. They had the same problem, but multiplied times 50 or 100, depending on how big their client base was. Um, and, you know, I had about all the fun in investment banking that I needed to have. Uh, to paraphrase, uh, it was a Jamie Diamond, I think. Um, and and so I was looking for another entrepreneurial thing to uh, to do to to get out. I'd been uh, part of entrepreneurial teams and been a founder before that. And I jumped out and started working in this uh, this area. Um, I didn't really have a specific concept. I just knew that there was a problem, and um, spent a couple of years uh, doing things like what you and I did, uh, just chatting with people. Um, who had these challenges personally and chatting with folks who had the, the challenges professionally and, um, and, and ultimately um, settled on, on Blue Leaf, um, which, uh, which started really as a, as a consolidated reporting platform. Um, and though we didn't think about it that way at the time, right? It was all about how do I bring 
all of the information uh, about every client together in one place, make it available to the client, make it available to the advisory firm uh, and their backend systems to tie it all together, right? Simpler for client, simpler for advisor. But most importantly for the advisor and client, it meant an understanding of everything they had and, and a shared understanding. And that was really important, sort of this idea of, of being collaborative from the get-go and, and being about the whole client. Um, and so we started our journey. Um, and, it, you know, um, I think we sold to our first customers in uh, 2012. Um, and we've been going at it ever since. I love it. You know, it was really interesting at that during those early days. And I was fortunate enough to be there. You, you were actually pinging me like, hey, Mike, can we chat about this type of stuff? And to hear you iterating about that. And it was one of the things that really struck me at that time is you were really spot on about something. It was very difficult. And I still think it's for, for some advisors, it remains difficult uh, for them to get a whole picture of, of, of their client's assets, right? Because sometimes clients are purposely hiding assets because they don't want to be charged on them, right? Uh, and, and, and sometimes they just, they're not purposely doing it. It's just it's, it's difficult for the advisor to get visibility into the assets without the, the client voluntarily going and getting a statement from whatever that plan is or whatever that account is and giving it. So it was a really interesting concept to start pursuing. One of the things that I started thinking about, and you know, anytime we do, do, do these shows, I, I go on uh, the guest uh, LinkedIn page, I go through, scroll through the LinkedIn, and I'm like, oh, let me learn a little bit more uh, because, you know, even though you know somebody, you're like, oh, do I, how much do I know about their career path? I haven't studied their LinkedIn journey. Uh, it's, and it, it, it's really kind of neat. You know, you know, Bill Simmons uh, always refers to this. You know, he does the IMDb dive on any movie guest he has. Uh, so it's kind of like your IMDb for your business life, I think. A couple of things jumped out at me. Number one, you mentioned you were investment banking, but you didn't have really the classical background in, in wealth management, right? You weren't a financial advisor. You weren't working in a financial advisory business. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, oh. so it, it turns out that uh, the older you get, um, the less likely you are to fill in all of the blanks from yeah. your early career. So, yeah, I was a Series 7 and 65 licensed advisor, and I did um, uh, work in a financial planning firm. Uh, I, I, I did that for about a year and a half. And I guess that's where I grew empathy for the <laughs> business and realized, oh my God, this is a hard business. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I realized for me, um, I was much more interested in the systems and the, um, and the processes, et cetera. Uh, and I was better suited to that. Um, you know, I, I certainly, you know, understand all the finance and accounting and, uh, and financial planning concepts, but um, it was more interesting to me to think about how the firm ought to, ought to run. Um, so, so that that career didn't take, but that empathy, that challenge, uh, stuck with me. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm glad you you shared that, and because like as you mentioned, I didn't see that. Uh, no, I did. I didn't do like the you know, exhaustive like you know FBI background check on you, but it's like um, <laughs> the. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, by the way, that, 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 you know, you, 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 you kind of gave it a go as an advisor. It was about a year and a half or so, you know, under two years. And, and, you know, I've spent a lot of time with that audience and, and, and I've been fortunate enough to speak at lots of conferences where it's for the top producers at an organization, right? So you're talking about for Morgan Stanley, as an example, you know, you gotta be making about a million dollars to be in that room. Uh, so you're talking to these really, really successful financial advisors. And one of my favorite questions to ask them when I kind of go to the cocktail party and mingle is how many years did it take you to feel successful? And it's almost always five, right? Before they felt like they were making any legitimate money. And it, it's a it's a challenging business, right? And as as you know, it's it's cumulative though. Like over time, you you mm -hmm. get a client. If you keep that client, great. At some point in time, you're gonna get another client. And and it because it's recurring revenue and structure, you gradually build up to by year five, probably a reasonable book of business that you can survive on and you can see the future. Uh, of that business. And, but it's, it, it, it's really, uh, I, I'm so I'm thrilled that you shared the fact that you had some experience there because it's a very unique space to be in compared to other industries. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And, and in hiring people for blue leaf from outside of the industry, because we really want that perspective as well. What's shocked me repeatedly is the learning curve mm. to to come up to speed and really understand 
the life of an advisor, um, the experience of a financial advisory firm. Um, it's, it's different. Um, and, uh, and it's, uh, you know, literally speaking in Greek at times, um, right? Alpha, beta. Alpha, beta, and, that's right. That's right. Um, and, uh, and I think the concepts, if you're not comfortable with finance, like the concepts can be very difficult to wrap your head around. If you're comfortable with finance, the, the, the flip side is it's hard to understand why everyone can't understand. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting space in that way. Yeah, I I, I've, I agree 100%. And so it, the um, uh, president and chief operating officer of, of Trulytics, an old friend of mine, Jeremy Carnell, uh, he didn't have a background in the financial services spaces either when he uh, co-founded uh, Trulytics with, with Terry Mullen. Now, Terry Mullen does. He has a deep, you know, he's, his whole career has been in this space. But, you know, Jeremy constantly kind of goes, wow, there's just every time you think you've got everything nailed down, there's something new that pops up that you didn't understand. And he said it really took him a couple of years uh, to really feel like he understood the alphabet soup uh, between you know, RIAs and you know, <laughs> registered reps. And you know, you know, which, what's the difference between an independent broker dealer and, and, and a wirehouse structure and all that type of stuff. So really, really uh, interesting. And, and you're right. Like, you do need the outside perspective, but it, it really helps to have some folks who, who, who know the space uh, fairly, fairly deeply. You know, one other thing that jumped out to me and this actually jumped out to me when early in, in our friendship, right? It, it, it was, well, John's spending a significant amount of time as an advisor to other startups and other early stage companies. And I, I was impressed by that, number one, and intrigued by it. And, but, but also, I've noticed that to be a pattern for other entrepreneurs. You know, So it, not too long ago, I had Henry Yoshida uh, on the show, uh, he's, he's been on this show and he's been on other podcasts that I host and, and I've known Henry for a while, uh, uh, founder of rocket dollar, co-founder of rocket dollar. Um, and he's done the same thing, right? He's been an angel investor in a lot of different fintech startups. Uh, he, he's been on the advisory board and so forth. Uh, how do you think that, that, that experience helped shape your, uh, kind of framework in terms of starting blue leaf and growing it, right? Cause you, 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 you had, different types of experiences there as an advisor. It wasn't just like one vertical. Uh, so maybe you could kind of share a little bit about that and how it came to be. Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think being an entrepreneur is, uh, is being part of a relatively small club. Um, and, um, it's a, it's a lonely business and, you know, for the financial advisors in the audience, you know, you two are entrepreneurs, you've had to start something. So I'm sure you, uh, you've, you've felt this at one point or another. It's, it's a lonely, long road. And um, once you've been through that, and this Blue Leaf is actually my seventh, you know, startup or early stage venture. Um, you, as soon as you've done it once, you, you recognize that and you, um, you both want to reach out for connection to others on that similar journey. Um, but you feel this deep need to help others. Um, I think it's, um, uh, it's just it's part of the experience, and um, and so you know that's always been the way that that I felt about uh, other entrepreneurs, and um, and I always wanted to connect, right? So like with you, um, we 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 reached out, we connected, um, and um, and you look for ways to help. I mean, that's mm -hmm. um, that's your starting position. How can I help this person that I'm speaking with, um, and um, and I think, I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs that, that feel that same way. Hey, I, I, I agree with, with that. I, I'm always accessible to entrepreneurs who have, you know, general questions or want to kind of grab the proverbial coffee, you know, not so much right now during a pandemic times, but you know, if somebody wants to just kind of bend the ear a little bit, Hey, I'm working on this project. What do you think about this? Whatever. Or who do you know? Uh, it is that type of club. Like you say that it, 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 it rising tide. I always think of it like that, you know, lifts all boats. But I also have been pleasantly surprised over the years, like how that karma seems to work, right? So you, you kind of give, give, give to the community. And at some point in time, it may not be from that person you helped, uh, but at some point in time, somebody's going to ping you on an email or, or whatever and say, hey, you know what? Uh, I want to work with you or I want to help you out. Uh, and I've just, I've seen that so many times over the years that, I, that it just made me have that kind of spirit of generosity that, that you're talking about. Um, but there's also some, 
I think there's some career benefits to it, right? Of being being in there, you learn a lot uh, when you're advising other companies formally uh, and so forth. Uh, I, I'm sure some of the, the folks listening, uh, the, the advisors, the executives at uh, broker dealer firms and, and, and the like, uh, may have an interest in doing that. What is is there a process or a recommended process that you could offer for them if they wanted to get involved in be, maybe in, in the startup community and and, and join teams as as, as advisors? Uh, or be involved in some way. What, what do you? What would you say to them to, to do that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think um, it's a little challenging to start out and say, "I want to advise companies." Mm. Right? I think um, I think it has to come from that spirit of generosity that you you mentioned earlier. I think it it needs to be more about um, what you can do to help. Uh, more of a service oriented uh, viewpoint. How can I serve? Um, these folks and help them. And um, by being generous, by offering assistance, help, et cetera, um, with it, and expecting nothing in return, as you said, it, it starts to generate um, things coming back your way. And in, in terms of being a formal advisor to companies, generally that, that happens after you've given advice and assistance and people want more. And there's there's kind of an unspoken line, you, you know, there's only so much time you can take a, of someone else's for free. Sure. And you start to feel like I'm really needing or depending on this person. Um, and I don't want them to go away. Um, so let's create this relationship where that continues. And that's, that's how I've seen it work. Um, uh, I think it works less well if, if someone's trying to start out in that formal capacity. Yeah, no, you, you, I think you're, you're right on that. And you know, the, the thing that I would add that I've seen work really well for people is kind of pick a niche that you're interested in. And not only is it good for marketing your business and so forth, but pick a community that you have a passion for, right? So if it's a tech industry, if you're a financial advisor and you're really interested in tech and you're kind of an early adopter on a lot of stuff, start hanging out at tech events, right? So go, so go to coder events, go to, you know, a startup events that are in your community, whatever, Kind of be there, interact, get to know some of the the the, the kind of the networking connector type folks, and like you said, be available, be offer to help. I mean, all these companies at some point in time are going to want to set up a retirement plan, right? They're going to have some questions about finance and 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 like. Uh, you can absolutely uh, be there for those folks, and if your community has some fintech startups, chances are they're going to want to talk to some financial professionals as well. And I think that niche idea is important, but it's you know. I don't think of that about that as an analytical exercise, like a business school assignment. I would think about that as following your interests and your passions, and um, and that's what's going to keep you involved and engaged, and uh, ultimately, you know, help you become valuable to those people you're interested in helping. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, it, you can't fake that you're interested in something, right? You're like, oh, this is the profitable niche, right? And that's all. I'm glad you pointed that out because you know I've talked to people for years and years and years, and you've know, said niche marketing is way to go, right? You know, pick the niche that that, and and I agree with that. Like, you know, I always start out like, hey, where did you go to school? What's your college? Uh, you know, that you went that you went to? Like, that's a niche, right? Like, serve people who went to University of Texas, right? You go hook them horns type of thing. Do that, or if you're if you have a passion for a certain sport or activity or whatever, kind of go to that community. Uh, Exactly, but but be avoid or be careful with forcing it, right? Because people can tell if you're not really interested, but you're just here for the money. They they got to figure it out, and it, and it's hard to get deep on topics that you're not interested in, right? You know, if absolutely, you're, yeah. I mean, like as an example, I like cars, right? I've always been a car guy since I was a kid. Uh, I would recognize if you were trying to fake it and saying, you know, about cars, I would recognize you didn't know what you were talking about when it came to uh, performance or features or whatever, right? I just, it would, it would register pretty quick. Um, well, let's kind of shift gears here uh, to some of the changes you've seen, right? So uh, we talked a little bit about tech and we talked about the the early days uh, of starting Blue Leaf. But one of the things that I, as I thought about it and, and, and we were talking about earlier, you and I haven't chatted in a while. And I started thinking about all the things that have changed since you and I were going to, uh, Ted's, uh, what was it? Was it Ted's right? Uh, the, 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 the restaurant there with the, for burgers and, and stuff like that. That's, that's right. <laughs> uh, uh, we, so we're, 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 we're sitting there and this is probably 2010 ish. Uh, if I had to guess correctly, a lot's changed. And I've always think about that 
Bill Gates uh, statement where he says, you know, people over tend to overestimate the amount of change that's going to happen in two years, but greatly underestimate the amount of change that's going to happen in 10 years, right? That when I think back to 2010, you know, the iPhone was only a couple of years old. Uh, when I was making kind of the the, the shift here in, into the, the digital world, uh, especially if you were in a room full of financial advisors, you look out and see Blackberries. You wouldn't see smartphones. You wouldn't see uh, tablets or you wouldn't see any type of Apple device whatsoever looking back at you from the audience, right? But now everybody's rocking an iPhone or an, uh, some sort of Android and, and they, they're using tablets while they're at a, a conference or what have you. Uh, what are some of the other big changes you've seen since, you know, as you mentioned, you got that first customer in the door in 2012, like it's been eight years, a lot of the world has changed dramatically. What, what have you seen? Yeah, the world has changed dramatically. And, um, you know, I think uh, on the technology side, I think that one of the biggest trends that we've seen is what I'd say the consumerization of business software. And so this is, you know, if you look at um, how fast uh, the the consumer technology landscape has evolved. The iPhone's a great example, um, or the v- variety of applications that are on the Android or or Apple stores, um, and the quality of these consumer facing applications. I think that has really rocketed forward um, and very fast. And what's happened is a lot of business software. You know, it turns out that business people aren't separate from consumers. They're also consumers. And, and those changing experiences, things that have gotten easier, um, has changed expectations on the business software landscape. And um, business software providers are having to evolve and, um, and adjust um, and, uh, and make their products um, better uh, for end users. And, um, Though um, that's been a, a slower evolution than I, I would have uh, would have expected or or hoped for, I think um, I think many uh, many vendors, and this isn't just in um, in wealth tech, but uh, but more broadly in business software, many vendors are still woefully behind the curve uh, in this. So so I think that consumerization and that trend, it's um, it's even longer term. I think you're going to see it play out over in the next ten years as well. The consumer technology is going to tend to lead business technology. I, you know, I could not agree with you any more vigorously about it because, you know, it's true. It's like, you know, when I was getting my career started, I can remember, you know, trying to use certain software, whether it was, whether it was at Fidelity or State Street, you know, big, huge, you know, uh, uh, global financial services firms. But a lot of the software was very much what we think of as classic enterprise stuff, right? And it requires you to go some, and sometimes a whole week of training on how to use the software uh, to get to the point where you're reasonably proficient in using it. And today's financial professionals, and for professionals in any industry, frankly, don't have time for that or the patience for that, right? There is an expectation that it's as easy as either opening up a browser tab and going to a website and typing in your username and password, or downloading an app from the app store again and getting started and it, and it should be relatively easy. It should not require a whole bunch of training and, 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 and pain in the butt to learn how to do it. It should feel like other things. I think you're hundred percent right on that. And, and some companies are, have been faster to do that. And one of the things that, and when I remember seeing the early days of blue leaf and watching and seeing the design and the approach, you, you kind of came at that. You were right at the cusp of like getting that from day one. I don't remember ever looking at blue leaf, and going, oh, this thing, come on. <laughs> we used to say when we were smaller, right? So when we started out, we weren't, you know, we weren't providing billing and, you know, household level rebalancing and some of the more complex functionality. Um, but but we used to say that if we needed to provide you a training and manual, we've failed, right? That's a failure of user experience design. Now, it's not entirely true just as, as, as a platform gets larger and larger. Um, you know, and people get more and more specialized, uh, you're going to need to provide some level of support. But that ethos still exists. We want 90% of the functionality in anything we build, and we think anything anyone builds, um, should be obvious. Um, 
But it turns out building things that are obvious is ridiculously hard. Um, it requires a certain kind of humility in terms of um, what needs to be present in the interface, um, and uh, you know a certain scientific approach to observing how people really behave, not just what they say, uh, but but what they do. Um, and it requires some discipline in observing the world and seeing how other widely distributed consumer experiences operate and leveraging those paradigms. Um, not easy. And I don't see a lot of that in, in business software. Um, so we, we've always felt that that was a competitive advantage and that's something that we uh, really believe in strongly. You know, I want to spend a couple of seconds on that because you, I remember from those early days of us sitting there talking across the table and you asking questions and what do you think? What do you think? And then you'd send over uh, prototypes and you'd take, take around with this. What do you think? What do you think? Type of stuff. And you're, you're right. There was a humility to it and, 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 and a willingness to have somebody go, no, this, this sucks. I wouldn't use it. Or this is hard, harder than it needs to be. And that means checking your ego at the door as an entrepreneur, as a developer, as a designer, that just because you think it looks awesome or just because you think this is the way the world should be doesn't mean the person who would actually use a product thinks it looks awesome or it's the way that it should be, right? Or that it's obvious that this is how I use this or this is how I get value out of this thing, right? And a lot of times we bang our heads against the wall because we're like, hey, look, I've studied the problem. I know what the problem is. If only you would change the way you do things and the way you think to the way that I think, the world would be a better place. And it turns out like, yeah, you know what? Friction matters. If somebody, if there's friction in their, in, in the adoption, uh, and I want to talk about adoption a little more in, in detail a little bit. If there's any friction there, like chances are I'm not going to use it. Or it's just one of those things. I, I was coining a phrase uh, a couple, I think I coined it. I'm going to take ownership right, right now for the world. I call it the today value, right? The today value of whatever solution you're presenting to me, that if that today value isn't obvious, then it's something I can do tomorrow or next week or whatever. And it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. It just means that, right, there's not a high level of today value in it. And today value can be diminished by pain in the butt of use, if you will, right? Or that I just can't. I, Absolutely. I can't really interesting. And and I think one other one other aspect we've seen you know repeatedly. So so one is um, you know um, you, you hear people commenting on how unattractive a design might or might not be, and it turns out you know attractiveness actually does matter somewhat. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of companies presume that a pretty coat of paint um, with pretty colors is the same thing as a great user experience. And mm -hmm. it couldn't be further from the truth. You actually have to understand how people work, how they process information. Um, and you have to make choices to help people process that information more easily. And, uh, and so we see a lot of things with pretty coats of paint that are really painful to use um, because that's not well understood. Uh, so, so it's, it really is a challenge. It's challenging discipline. Um, it's, it's undervalued in the, um, in the, uh, wealth tech, uh, community. Um, but when you get it right, it's really rewarding and, and customers really, really appreciate it. And sometimes they don't even realize what's driving their appreciation for what you've done. They'll describe it as it's really easy to use, um, and, and can't articulate it any more than that. And they don't have to, right? This is not something any anyone needs to understand, other than than folks who are vendors trying to deliver these experiences. You know, and and I think that's relevant for advisors and for wealth management firms as well, right? Even if they're not developing technologies and not thinking about. So, if you're listening to this or watching this on the YouTube's, if you're if if you're here for this show and, and you're going, hey, they're talking a lot about developing tech products. Think about your the statements that you present to your clients or the emails that you present to your clients, right? That is a user experience. That is your customer. How are they interacting with your company? And moving forward into the next decade, 
you get to have more of that. You're going to be presenting information and having experience and interacting with your client more and more digitally, right? If Especially this pandemic has taught us anything. Like you're not sitting across the table for every interaction with your clients now. It's going to be on screens. It's going to be uh, on their phones. So your user experience matters and you have to have the humility as you described to ask them like, would you like something different? Or if they give you feedback, don't take offense. Think like, why are they giving me that feedback? How can I improve the presentation of this stuff, right? 100%. And I'll take it a little bit further. One of the things that I often think about in, in those quiet moments is that if you think about it, um, uh, wealth management, that service only exists in the experience. It only exists in where we present information to a client or where we talk to them or, or how we interact with them, right? It's, it's essentially all abstract. So, so the product that you're, or the service you're delivering is the experience. Um, and, and that is going to need to be more and more thoughtfully designed over time. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, you know, speaking of that, as we think about the future here, that the, you know, the next decade, right, of, of Blue Leaf and and all the other things we're, we're working on and interested in in the space, uh, you know, I had Tony Steak, uh, the chief operating officer of Advise and Navaplan, on the show uh, recently, and he mentioned that one of the things they're seeing for that next decade is more interactivity uh, and, and and more collaboration uh, between the advisor. In the client, right? That it's going to be kind of almost like more application based, right? In terms of like instead of the advisor sitting down in a financial planning solution and and plugging in all the numbers, it's going to be you know the 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 client is going to be able to interact with it kind of like real time if they will, right? They want like maybe you know in an app or whatever, be able to click this button or what if I thought about this or whatever, and it's kind of be more of a feedback back and forth uh, collaborative thing. Uh, one of the things that's always been kind of impressive to me about, especially what I think back to the early days of Blue Leaf is like, you've always been that way, right? Like the kind of the founding ethos of the company was the ability for the client and the advisor to interact. But there's also this concept of connecting via like APIs and, and, and other mechanisms to, to bring in information. So I, I wonder, like, are those themes going to continue or are you thinking about some, some, some other stuff for the next decade or so? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, uh, look, I, I think Tony's Tony's certainly right um, that that um, additional collaboration um, and interactivity is going to uh, become more and more important. Um, I think that that um, that framing of it is um, is is a little more narrow than the way that we think about it, and it makes sense, right? Um, it's it's a it's a framing of it that makes sense if you're a planning company, right, and right. and I think that's great, and. From our perspective, that's just really one aspect of uh, technology becoming ever more an extension of the advisor. So not just in the background, but in the foreground and a way that the advisor can be present um, and interact with clients, um, uh, you know, um, uh, more broadly, right, across, you know, geographies, uh, more virtually, um, uh, but also more and more driven by technology that is intelligent and uh, executes the advisor's intention, not just their instruction, if that makes sense. Mm. So I think you're going to see, um, you're going to see systems, you know, certainly the, these are areas that we're, we're working on where, um, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning is used not to replace an advisor, but, to augment the advisor, right? To think about, I think in the future, every advisor is going to look a little bit more like Tony Stark. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Where, where, where the technology is the suit, right? But maybe more importantly, the, the intelligence, it's Jarvis. And that's how we view what we're building. We want... Um, we want to multiply what the advisor is able to do. Our vision, in fact, is um, is that in the future, an advisor could service 500 clients mm. by themselves more intimately than they can 50 today. I really, you know, I, I agree. And I, frankly, I think that's going to be necessary, right? You know, Tony and I talked about that as well. Like, you know, the, 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 one of the ethos, founding ethos of, of Trulytics is that they're, 
there's a coming wave of transition, right? That about 40% of advisors, according to Cerulli, are going to exit the business in the next decade, right? Because of just age demographic reasons. And, and there is a, a reasonable fear uh, founded by data that there's not enough young advisors to replace those advisors as they leave. And so by logical extension, we're going to need technology efficiencies to service clients. Cli uh, advisors are going to have to service more clients uh, in the same amount of time that they serve their current clients. And, and they may have to do it while earning less money because we've seen some pricing compression. Absolutely. Um, and the only way to do that is through technological efficiencies, right? And so I like the Jarvis thing, right? That because you know, I had the, uh, the Vise founders uh, not too long ago, and they've created a solution using artificial intelligence and machine learning to create custom portfolios for individual clients, kind of with the same ease that you could use a model portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of it, you know, the, the advisor having to sit down and special snowflake it uh, in a spreadsheet sure. or, or whatever, you know, let's put in some preferences and, and, and let the th machine go to work to come up with a suggested portfolio of, of individual securities. And it was really, really interesting. Uh, and then I had the Benjamin uh, founder, uh, Matt uh, Reiner on not too long ago, and same, same thing, right? You know, what are some repetitive tasks that we can take off the advisor's plate that are just, they do them every single time they open up a new account or every mm -hmm. month they send certain emails. Like, can we just make that automated? Uh, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's, that's coming and, and it'll be, I think it'll be welcomed not only from the advisor, mm -hmm. but from the client, right? Uh, Absolutely. And th what you're describing right now is really just the first wave of that. That is the low hanging fruit. Let's automate a repetitive task, right? That's actually fairly straightforward. Um, even if you're using machine learning to, to do it, still today, pretty straightforward to do. Um, if you think about how the advisor spends time um, at an individual or firm level and how that time's allocated, what you're seeing is we are adding automation to things that are annoying and time consuming, but don't actually um, uh, comprise the majority of an advisor's time, um, right? So trading and rebalancing, um, even before automation, you know, most firms spend less than 15% of their time on that. So, so you're saving time, but not, um, not a material amount compared to the time that you have. Um, when you think about things like client interaction and, and monitoring of portfolios and sort of communication with clients, um, and in all its various forms, that's where the majority of most advisors' time is spent, presuming they're not a planning specialist, right? That they're, they're client facing. And it is there that it is harder and more important that we add leverage and intelligence to, to make that, um, uh, make that advisor more effective for more people. That's, that's really true. It's interesting. Uh, one of the other things that you and I have talked about over the years, and, and I've been seeing more and more of, and Tony, I talked a little bit about it because the uh, advising Navaplan has a robust suite of APIs for interacting with their solution is that connectivity between applications and different solutions, right? That it's, 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 you know, look, Blue Leaf is doing the things that Blue Leaf does, right? It doesn't have to do everything for the client, but there's going to be a need. I assume you, you felt this for Blue Leaf to talk to other things and other things to be able to talk to Blue Leaf, right? Um, I, I didn't do any super deep dive digging. Have you developed APIs or is there, is there, is there a way for, uh, I'll use Trulytics as an example for Trulytics to connect to Blue Leaf and, and, and vice versa. Uh, or is that something that's kind of on the, on the roadmap? Oh, no, we were one of the first with an API in the market. Um, so I think we rolled out the first version of our API in 2012, in, uh, in fact. Um, and uh, we've believed in that sort of open uh, system connectivity from the get-go. It's really critical, um, as you say, because you need to connect. Um, our future vision is to make the distinction between best of breed and all-in-one uh, nonsensical, right? It, it, because what, what we've seen is all in one products are essentially a compromise across the board, right? Just to achieve the all in one functionality. Uh, and, um, very few all in one products do anything well, never mind everything well. And right. so what we want to make that, we want to make that a false choice. Um, so I think what you'll see in the future is, easier and easier open integrations, not closed like former efforts in our industry, like silver bullet 
um, which were, you know, a cabal like structure that was sort of, you had to be uh, invited in and, and pledge fealty and, you know, whatever you had to do. Um, I think it all has to be open again, the way that consumer applications are um, right. Um, I think we all have to remember that this is the advisory firm's experience. It's the advisory firm's technology stack. And while we'd all like to do everything for everyone, um, that's not going to be most firms' choice. And so we need to build a way to valuably support those individual choices. Yeah, I, I agree with wholeheartedly. I mean, people are going to have those preferences, like you say, of certain things like, hey, I've been using this solution for a long time. I really like it. Uh, I, I know how everything works. Uh, but I do want to use your solution too. So can we use it together? Right. Uh, and then for you, it just, it lightens up if you're, if you're a solution like Trulytics or, or, or Blue Leaf or, or Navaplan, it lightens the load. You get to focus on the things you're good at. And if your client wants to experience something else in the app or, you know, take the information and consume it in a different way, uh, you can do that. And it, and, and, uh, you know, I asked this question because, uh, I think it's informative for, for the listener to, you know, if, if you're an advisor sitting there thinking about your business and, and. And, and I know there's a fair amount of anxiety, not only because we're in a pandemic time and, and what have you, but uh, technology is moving quick. And, and one of the things we hear from some of the senior advisors, you know, those who are 60 plus, uh, is, is they're starting to feel like they can't keep up with technology. And, and one of the things that I try to encourage is, look, it, it, it's not, you don't have to revamp and reinvent yourself 100%. It, it, it is baby steps, for lack of a better phrase, right? You can, you add, it's additive. You can kind of start to add some things. Don't be afraid to tinker and try a couple of different things. Um, and, and that leads me into my kind of my, my last conversation topic with you is, is uh, you know, what surprised you the most as you've grown the firm? Because, you know, one of the things that I know, uh, just having been involved in, in, in a variety of fintech startups and, and firms that uh, service the wealth management space is that oftentimes uh, adoption can be challenging, right? It takes time. It takes persistent effort. Um, especially for financial advisors, uh, what are some of the things that have surprised you uh, as you've moved through this? I mean, you're you're a mature uh, company now. You, uh, you know, you may still think of yourself as early stage, but you know, look, you know, eight years in, uh, company's pretty mature, right? You, you've got a stable client, you're growing, and so forth. So, what's what's the uh, what have been some of the surprises? You know, <clears throat> for me, it was. Um falling prey to Bill Gates, you know, uh, observation about change in the short term versus the long term. And um, back when we started, um, we were entirely online. So there was no ability to generate a static PDF report because we thought, well, that's completely a thing of the past. Why would you want to do that when you can just get online and interact and sort of, you know, uh, do do that on demand and still to this day <laughs> um the vast majority of the advisory community provides these sort of quarterly statements um sometimes it's because they believe that that's what's required when in fact it's not um there are some requirements but you know, it doesn't specify that um and in many cases it's because it's what i've always done and and so I think um, the speed, the, the slow speed of that transition has really surprised us um, and how um, unevenly distributed the future is. <laughs> so we have, we have firms and I, back in 2014, one of our customers got written up in the Wall Street Journal for completely ditching the quarterly report. And, you know, how she did it, how successful, how her clients loved her, et cetera. And we're like, we thought, yes, everyone's going to do this now. And eh, not so much. Um, <laughs> people are migrating that way. Um, but it takes a lot. And, you know, don't get me wrong. It is not just advisors, right? It's, it's clients to it's people, right? People mm. don't love to change. Um, but if you show them a wildly better way, they're happy to. And so we've we've started to see uh, see a trend that that you know if we really show somebody um, and demonstrate and let them feel what it's like um, to experience this this better approach, then people adopt it. And and so um, we're still optimistic that we're we're going to kill the traditional quarterly report. I love it. I love it. You know, a friend of mine. 
uh, once said, you know, money has momentum. And you know, we were talking about, you know, fintech, some of the fintech startups that were coming out there, you know, for money management and uh, uh, for banking and what have you. And he's like, look, if I've had my money at Big Bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, whatever it is for years and years and years, and I haven't had any major problems. It's a lot of effort to move, right? It's going to mm-hmm. keep my money at Fidelity, or keep my money at Bank of America, or wherever wherever the place is. Uh, and 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 I think getting getting a little beyond that, it's just like status quo has momentum. Just doing the way things the way that I've always done them just has momentum. It's like okay, you know, my client, I've always give my clients, like you said, I've always done it this way. But also, there's that I think my clients expect it. I think it's or it's just this is a process. Every you know, at the end of the quarter, week after, I'm generating reports. This is what I do. Uh, and so sometimes to your point, it, it does take, I wouldn't call it a shock event, but you know, it does take something, uh, to get people to move a little bit, right? It's either a pain or a, the, the potential of, of pleasure. And I think, you know, it's a little bit of both now, right? People going through a shock event here with the pandemic, uh, there is also this, it causes you to reassess and go, Hey, wow, I could free up a whole bunch of my time. I could take on new clients. If I just kind of take, t- t- took certain things off my plate. Really, really interesting. Well, John, this is really, really interesting. I, I know we're coming up to the end here, and I'm sure some people are going to be wanting to follow up with you and, and have some curiosity. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you and, and the team there at Blue Leaf? Yeah, so any email to Blue Leaf, uh, info at blueleaf.com, I'll, I'll see. I, I look at many of those personally and certainly are our team does. Um, we are also launching our own uh, new podcast um, uh, in partnership with Breaking Banks. Um, uh, the first uh, episode is going to run on Breaking Banks on October 22nd. Um, it's called The Augmented Advisor. So if you want to hear more about that, uh, that concept where you as an advisor can become Tony Stark, uh, we're going to talk about that in all its permutations. I love it. I love it. And you know what? And if you're marketing this thing, you're look, looking for keywords, you should just like match it up with awesome sci-fi shows and financial advisors. So financial advisors who are sci-fi fans, you got to get them all. It's going to be great. I love it. It'll be great. This has been fantastic. Well, thank you very much, John. I really appreciate your time. It's been great having your show and great catching up, buddy. So yeah, it's been great. wonderful to see you in person. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. It's always wonderful to have you with us. As I mentioned at the top of the show, please do like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you like to get your podcast jam on, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, SoundCloud, or the YouTubes. Love to hear from you there. So subscribe, follow, whatever the platform calls it, and add a comment if it's available. Love to hear from you. Let John know, by the way, John Prendergast, that you enjoyed hearing from him on the show. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Speaking of John, huge thanks to John for joining me. And I can't tell you how delightful it was for me to see John face to face. It's It's been quite a while. And it's always a good reminder that, hey, look, you got lots of friends. You got lots of people that are in your life, whether they're friends, family, colleagues who are also friends like John. Ping them. Offer to get on a Zoom or whatever just to see them face to face. It'll make you feel good. It'll make them feel good. And, you know, sometimes there's a, some benefit to getting out of your little working from home fishbowl that we all are in here, right? And, and even if you're going to the office, chances are the office is more sparsely populated than it used to be pre pandemic. So it's always good to see other people and share some ideas and talk about life and all that good jazz. So make sure you do that. Okay. As always, please do make sure you're wearing your mask and keeping your distance. And you know what I'm going to say next, being nice to each other, okay? Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you next time on the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. See ya. Bye.